markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast. We are on episode 247, and I am Tessa, your co-host of Chat with Traders. It's been way too long, and it's about time that we have a discussion on Forex trading. But this is not your average Forex trading discussion. This is an episode that I am especially excited for you Forex traders out there and for non-Forex traders like myself, because I got a few important key takeaways that I didn't expect. Today, our host, Ian, conducts an exciting interview with Jamal Adib. Some Forex traders may be unaware of how stop-loss hunting and market manipulation is done by the smart money. Like many Forex traders, ex-stockbroker Jamal Adib experienced early losses which compelled him to study the inner workings of Forex trading and how stop-loss orders are hunted by the smart money. Jamal spent four years pouring over thousands of charts of different time periods and programmed his carefully back-tested algorithms resulting in him winning an international forex competition. He shares his enthusiasm and much wisdom of the opportunities and dangers of trading forex and why you need an edge. As a side note, Jamal Adib will be joining us in a live discussion inside the Chat with Traders community scheduled for November 16th, where he and Ian will continue this lively discussion on Forex. If you'd like to join this private online membership community, go to the Chat with Traders website and then inside the menu bar, click on Community. We hope to see you there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, we are so pleased to present Jamal Adib. Jamal, I'd uh, like to welcome you to Chat with Traders and love to uh, find out a little bit about your background, kind of what got you into the financial markets. Yeah, thank you so much, Ian. It's a true honor to be on this podcast. I'm very excited. So my mom is German and my dad is Iranian. That's where my name comes from. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I grew up in Germany. I went to high school there. I was always a very driven person, very proactive. You know, I was uh, president of the student council and all kinds of things. I graduated from high school with like a 1.3 average, which is equivalent to like an A+. I went to uh, study a Bachelor of Science in Economics in Maastricht and also at um, Whitworth University in Spokane. <laughs> and yeah, I did a Master of Finance a, um, also after that at EDEC Business School in Nice, France. I went also to um, Harvard Summer School after that. And during my studies, Ian, I already did several internships, you know, at investment banks. Um, for example, uh, I was at Goldman Sachs in London. I was at um, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in London. I was also at uh, Saal Oppenheim in, in Frankfurt. And to make a long story short, you know, um, I did my master thesis, which was about fractal finance. And um, I graduated. I worked as a stockbroker and investment manager. And then for the last 10 years, I basically traded Forex full time and both you know, manual and, and automated. And um, uh, and to be honest, this is a great point in time for a Forex interview because as you know, Ian, the stock market is coming down as expected. We had the crypto crash. So more and more people will look at Forex now, I think. <laughs> so you have experience with equities and I'm curious what uh, led you to focus just on Forex? Yeah, that's a great question. That's correct. So, um, you know, when I was a broker, I was trading a lot of equities as well as options on stocks. And um, I liked it a lot. You know, what happened is I started to create own uh, Forex systems in my free time. You know, back then, these systems were quite rudimentary. I mean, if I look Mm -hmm. at what I'm doing today, you know, (laughs) it was really like just some very basic statistical systems, you know, like uh, not very complex. And what happened as well is, Ian, um, there was this one client, as I remember, you know, and he used to call now and then and place uh, Forex trades. And I saw everybody doing all kinds of things, you know, buying equities, uh, trading ETFs, bonds, etc., options. And this particular gentleman, he was like, you know, sniping, placing Forex trades. And most of the time, they were also good trades. And I kind of got hooked, you know, like... Um, 
I, I started to research myself about Forex and I, I really, you know, found out that this is my passion within the financial markets, you know. Um, that's basically how it happened, yeah. What could you share about what what do you think the advantages or opportunities available in Forex that might not be available in the stock market? Uh, some, I've heard some traders argue that, well, you know, Forex has a very limited number of choices of what you can do. And with the stock market, you have thousands of different equities you can trade and there's more opportunity for inefficiencies. Uh, how do you respond to that? Yes, I mean, and that particular topic, you know, gets us straight into it. So that's that's right. So on the one hand, yes, we know that the foreign exchange markets are the world's largest financial markets. You know, we have to re- remember that, you know, like the daily transaction volume in, let's say, euro dollar can be five, six trillion US dollars. That means that if you add up all stocks in the world, yeah, we have many days where the transaction volume in, in Forex far exceeds, you know, the global stock markets. So it is a massive, massive market. It's open 24 seven, uh, well, 24 five, it closes on Friday and opens on, on Sunday night. It's very liquid. The transaction costs are low. We have uh, loads of movement. So when you look at those factors, Ian, all of that looks like really, really attractive for trading, doesn't it? You know, like you think, come on, I mean, this is really what you want if you want to, you know, actively trade a financial market. But as we know, on the other hand, you know, there are certain things which, you know, like um, show us that something is off. So, for example, Ian, when you look at the 10 biggest hedge funds in the world right now, you do not really find a single fund which is like completely dedicated to Forex, you know? <laughs> so like there may be a pot-based funds which, you know, have certain teams doing Forex strategies, yes. But, you know, we don't really have a massive uh, fund which is specialized in, in trading Forex only. In particular, well, Why is not... that? Why, why do you think well, that is? I, that's a great question. And that the answer to that is, to make a long story short, and that's what we're going to focus on today, I guess, is market manipulation. See, Ian, so in 2013, we, we still had the big FX fund, which was called FX Concepts. It was managed by John Taylor. And, you know, this fund, it did very well over decades. It had $14 billion under management, you know, so it was big. But in 2013, it went bankrupt. And uh, to make a long story short, Ian, what's going on in this market? And that's also why experienced traders do not want to touch it. And they are right in that sense. The market it has a, comp- a very particular structure and very particular dynamics. I'm completely specialized in that. And I hope that I can really shed some light on that today. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like uh, the reason for the bad statistics, which we know, for example, that, you know, over a four month period, 84% of traders trading Forex lose. If you increase this by another four months, we're talking more like 95% of traders lose money in Forex. So, you know what I mean? These are the harsh statistics. So this is a bit of a fact check. And also, Ian, as you know, you have like, I think, 250 podcasts so far. Very few on Forex, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, very few. (laughs) So, you know, the reason for that is that, first of all, as a price taker in this market, without specific knowledge on the Forex market structure, your chances of success are very, very low. Because Mm -hmm. you need to understand how the so-called smart money algorithms actually operate, um, what kind of principles they apply to the market every single day, you see? like, And and please also understand, these kind of topics, like um, they are inherent to the market itself. All the uh, broker manipulation, for example, comes on top of that, you see? We can talk about that later as well. But what I'm uh, focusing here right now is, the actual price action. Why does euro dollar, you know, move like it does and go up and down like it does? Why does the price action look so erratic to outsiders who do not understand that market? You know, I can explain in detail why that is the case. And and by the way, I should also uh, say clearly that, you know, I have been uh, publishing a, a large part of my work already for four years so, you know, I have this YouTube channel, uh, uh, you know, I have over 630 videos there, live trades, live analysis, you know, it's, it's called SME FX. So you're free to go there if you want to, you know, know a bit more about all that. But you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's not that I'm here uh, since yesterday. I've actually decided already some years ago to to publish that kind of work. 
and to show the technology which which we have, the charts which we have with leading information. And, you know, at this point, Ian, around a thousand people have been following my work and many of those have actually become good traders in their own right. You know, they have been also using that, that website I created and, you know, I'm very pr proud of that work. You know, also, by the way, <laughs> I'm, I'm still working on this book, you know, maybe in the next two years I will finally, finally mm -hmm. finish it. I'm so sorry. It takes a lot of time because most of the time I'm, I'm trading, you know, trading is always my priority. Everything else uh, I do by the side. But but what I'm saying is, look, I, as a little disclaimer, I will make some big claims in this podcast, but please understand everybody who listens to this. First of all, there's a lot of public evidence out there. Yeah. Like the newspaper articles where, you know, it's exactly explained which kind of entities got fined for Forex rigging. You know, there's even a statement by the U.S. Department of Justice explaining how certain entities have engaged in, in forex manipulation. So first of all, don't take this from me. You need to, you know, if you do your research and you find a lot of content also on my on my channel about that, you will see that this is basically how the how the market works. Also, Ian, you know, I would like to emphasize straight away, you know, one has to understand that this kind of market manipulation or however you want to call it is also necessary to a certain degree. Like forex would be different if you know these entities wouldn't be doing what they do right. i don't want to get too far off topic but you know if you take a historical view on things you know and you go back decades you can see that in all financial markets you know to some degree we always had you know like certain things going on you know by market makers you know by the by the sell side you know in that in that context you know and also by the way there's not necessarily even a, a conflict of interest regarding the market structure because people have to understand when we talk about the dump money, yeah. If you wouldn't mind me interrupting here, just because I I'd love to get into that uh, shortly, I'd like to bring it back to the your background, if you wouldn't mind, and then yeah. we, um, you're in 2013. I understand you created a your forex firm. Yeah. So what happened is, you know, um, I, I was still a, a broker and investment manager. I, I got to know, you know, um, certain people. They were um, uh, founders of a big gaming firm. And, you know, we got to know each other. And they said, Jamal, are you interested in, you know, focusing on, on trading? I said, sure. What happened is, you know, we actually uh, created two funds. One of them was supposed to be a, a stock and option fund, but it never really got operational, unfortunately. <laughs> it would have made a fortune because it was just before the, you know, big bull market of the last day. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't launched. So we, we launched, however, like a, a small Forex fund. And, you know, I started basically uh, focusing on, on Forex spot trading. And at the beginning back then, you know, like uh, it didn't go very well because, you know, all the systems I had put together, they were not really, you know, consistent. So, you know, it, it was at a point where I was like, oh, you know, this is not as I thought. However, what happened then, Ian, is... Um, you know, first of all, I got to know with you know some really good people, some really good programmers. One in particular, I'm not sure whether he wants his name mentioned, but we worked together and we, we started working on tools, you know, which analyze certain uh, data, for example, position data, uh, uh, limit data, order data, you see. And we were really just tinkering. It's not that we understood how this works. You see, it's I should also really be humble and say that I was... You know, I was very motivated to get to the bottom of this. I really wanted to understand how Forex actually works. And as soon as we started, you know, uh, experimenting with certain tools, we quickly realized, you know, it was like a true aha moment. I was like, okay, wait a second. Here we have those positions. Here we have certain orders accumulated. And then, you know, the move goes exactly goes against those positions, then to the accumulation of uh, orders on the other side so it, it didn't take long until i realized okay this game can be cracked and you know like we need to you know work hard and you know like really really you know uh, improve our tools and, and get to the bottom of this and that was a multi-year process ian you know <laughs> mm. i worked like crazy you know like I, <laughs> if i commit to something i really you know work hard and that's basically uh, what i did you see and and then, you know, the more we uh, realized what's going on, you know, the more... Now, I have to explain also in that context, you know, I took a very radical approach, Ian. I said, you know what? First of all, I just will observe how this market structure unfolds. You know, I will not come with any ideas or theories how it should be. No, 
I will simply observe how it unfolds. And then in the second phase, I will basically analyze what's going on. And then in the third step, I will, you know, try to derive general rules from that. You see, like it was really necessary because many things, which I will also explain today, are a bit counterintuitive. For example, maybe we jump a bit into that, if you don't mind, in mm -hmm. uh, stop hunting. No, you wanted also to talk about stop hunting. My understanding is that you, you created, you got into programming algorithms. Is that correct? Well, so, uh, no, I should be more precise. So within the last four years, I also created fully automated strategies. So my own trading algos, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but but that's basically covering my automated Forex trading. But regarding the um, creation of the market causality, this market structure technology, basically, you know, um, I paid also programmers to, you know, implement it, you know, to, to build it. So that enabled, once the tools were good enough and, and we fine tuned and everything, then I was able to formulate the complete market causality and, you know, to formulate also those principles, you know, how the mechanics actually unfold in real time. And that, of course, then enables you to also predict uh, price moves, you see? So um, that's basically, you know, like uh, the sequence, uh, how it works. So, so in a nutshell, to summarize, First, I really, you know, uh, um, did the complete market causality. And then at a later stage, I also developed a fully automated trading algos myself. You see? Mm -hmm. uh, once you started implementing these fully automated systems, uh, how was your return and uh, drawdowns impacted uh, by using these trading systems versus prior when you did things manually? Um, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Uh, so regarding my own trading, I, I moved more and more to automated systems. So I used to be like a fully manual trader and I still, you know, trade manually. Uh, you know, many of my trades are documented on YouTube. You can you can watch them where I just basically directly trade the market causality. Yeah, so I, I, I wait for certain setups. Let's say it's a post stop hunt. Uh, set up or you know like a squeeze move whatever it is and, and then i traded them now when it comes to my automated trading i basically incorporated certain principles from the market causality into those strategies yes but the strategies themselves are, are still kind of um, statistical you know what i mean so it's not that they need all the information which i use for the manual trading and um, as you can see, like maybe also in the future, we, uh, another time we can also talk in detail about the automated systems, you know, how they need to be set up. You know, it's, it's also a topic on its own. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question, so, you know, my, my strategies in, in my bot portfolio, they all have like a great uh, relationship between like, you know, net profit and, and maximal drawdown. Like I would say as a general rule regarding these kind of uh, trading bots, if you can achieve, you know, like a, a net profit, which is uh, two, three or four times higher than your maximal drawdown, you know, then you are on a very good way. The next thing, of course, then is to try to limit the, the length and the depth of any drawdowns. But what you do is you have a portfolio of different strategies, of course, and then there's also a bit of diversification across, you know, markets, timeframes, uh, strategy styles, etc. You know, so <laughs> it's a big automated trading in is also a big passion of mine. And, you know, I, I'm willing to talk a lot about it. Uh, but maybe, you know, first we, we cover the causality because that's really how the market itself works. You see? Mm -hmm. So uh, my understanding in 2019, you won an international Forex competition. That's correct. So, you know, that is also <laughs> quite a story. And I would argue that my whole path it's quite an outlier, you know, like all the things that happened, you know, they are quite unique. And yeah, that's correct. You know, there was a, a forest competition. Um, I was contacted. Uh, we were invited to several locations in Europe. Uh, there was a group of traders uh, all doing forex, And yeah, there were different stages. I think three stages. Uh, I won this competition also because I used the, the market causality. And, you know, that, that was also very, very interesting experience uh, uh for sure <laughs> right um so do you just did you create one program within the market causality or did you create multiple programs for different uh, market conditions 
Okay, so regarding the automated strategies, the bots, I, I run like uh, at least eight different ones. So it's like a strategy portfolio, yes. So so these are uh, like eight um, different uh, trading strategies. But regarding the causality, you see, that's a good chance now for, for me to explain that. So there are like very defined setups you can trade as a price taker on the buy side you know, using the market causality, that leading information, I've defined them very clearly. Yeah. For example, let's say there's a dumb money switch and the dumb money goes from one side to the other and the major top stops are cleared and, you know, like the market snaps into the opposite direction uh, and, you know, other very defined setups. Now it's important to understand the market causality, Ian, it's not a strategy or anything. It's how the market really is, you know, like how you play it or how you trade it, whether you do it many Manually or whether you do it in an automated way, you know, that's kind of another chapter, you know, in, in this context. So also within the market causality, there are different setups that sh- which are tradable. Now, I have shown over the years on, on my channel, like the setups I successfully traded, but, uh, you know, there are more setups than that. And that's also something I've learned uh, just in the last two years, also by, you know, other traders using that and, and coming up with their own approaches, you know, like, there, there's some degree of freedom because to be very precise, you know, there are traders, they don't want to do day trading. They will just want to place trades every few weeks. So they go to the higher time frames, you know, like the four hour chart, the day chart. And for example, they just wait until the dumb money really goes significantly on one side. They do the trade and they just ride the move, you know, like, like similar to traditional trend following. And if you look at Euro dollar recently, for example, you know, or, or, which went down so much against the dumb money longies, or you look at dollar yen, which did the reverse, which went up so much against the shorties. You know these uh, these traders they did very well just riding the move over over days and weeks. You know because mm. you could literally say how the dumb money for whatever reason kept on trading on one side. So you know like so that's for example one way of trading it. But there are also people who who love you know day trading and and more high frequency trading. Uh, for that, of course, you need to be more advanced. You need to have more experience. Um, and you wait for very particular setups. Yeah. For example, let's say, you know, like um, you see that, you know, th- there was a news announcement and the dumb money goes very strongly on one side. And, you know, the, the market will retest the low, let's say, against the longies. These kind of things can be, you know, very tradable. So you mentioned a lot about dumb money. So we could call that ignorant money. And so for new traders, so what aspects of Forex trading is most challenging for new traders and how do, how can we mitigate this? Yes, that's a great question. Um, first of all, allow me to emphasize, Ian, yes, we say the money, but we do not mean that in any disrespecting way, because these are all very intelligent people, smart people, but as you said yourself, they suffer from an informational disadvantage. That's it all. If we play poker now, Ian, yes, and you have cards and I have cards and there are cards on the table. If there's a player who can see our cards <laughs> and who can also decide what the next card on the table is, you know what I mean? <laughs> that creates an informational advantage for that player. That makes us the dump money and that makes that player the, the smart money. So allow me you know, to use a chance to emphasize Look, there are very, very intelligent people around the world, dedicated people. But unfortunately, you know, by not understanding how the market structure actually works, they never have a real chance in successfully trading Forex. You see, and that, by the way, that brings us back to our discussion from the beginning. You know, that's the reason why experienced traders tend to stay away from Forex, knowing that, you know, these things are going on. They know it intuitively. You see what I mean? And um, that also creates this complexity and difficulty regarding uh, forex trading so so to answer your question regarding new traders look and and i feel strongly about this you do not need to you know study economics or you know read a lot of books i mean the fact is you know that uh, there's a massive gap between economic theory and reality yeah and uh, regarding you know books right now there are no great you know books on on the actual forex market structure out there i hope i can change that at some point the best thing you can do um and really the last thing i want is this here to sound like a sales pitch but <laughs> you know if you would ask me my honest answer would be you know watch first of all all the videos i have for my channel start with the educational videos understand all the things such as 
the Damani positions, the stop hunting, how news announcements are used or abused, how there are shortened games as well. Watch all these videos, yes, study it, try to understand it, then maybe watch some of the live videos to see how this can be traded. Then, you know, like uh, at some point, maybe subscribe to the charts. First do demo trading, yeah, for a few weeks minimum. You need to get a feeling for how all these things unfold in front of your eyes, you know. And then once you have passed all that, then you can think about, you know, uh, going live and actually trading that. In the internet, there's so much wrong information. And when you see also people's comments, you know, on Forex trading, you know, don't you see often that comment, yeah, it's all about discipline. Don't you see that often? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, definitely. I, fully, I disagree with that. It's not only about discipline. Yes, you need discipline, but it's no way enough to have discipline. You know, you need a proven edge next to discipline. If you do not have those two components, your chances of being successful are close to zero. That is the reality. Mm. And you know, the problem is, Ian, we have this industry out there which promotes, you know, all these, all these different companies. They're selling indicators. They're selling EAs. You know, they, they sell courses. They do whatever. And they try to, you know, draw this picture that everybody can just, you know, go and open an account and start trading and make money. That is not the case, you know? And that's also, by the way, why, you know, I decided to make all of this also uh, public. I always think, Ian, of this retired engineer, you know, who maybe has savings of 200, 300K, maybe more, maybe less, whatever the amount is. He goes to the internet, you know, he sees all these advertisements by brokers, by, you know, uh, trade seeding companies, whatever it is. And he thinks, come on, how difficult can it be? You know, like, how difficult can it be to, you know, create a system where my predictions are higher than 50%. And, and these things, they end most of the time in a horrible manner. You know, these people, they end up getting caught into this loop. They lose all their money. They, you know, they, they get frustrated. So question for you, have you tested out the commercially available program trading uh, options out there? And uh, if you have, what, what are their greatest strengths and weaknesses? Compared to a professional Forex system, for example. Yeah, so I have tested pretty much everything over many years, Ian. So, you know, we're talking about 10 thousands of hours. I've tested all kinds of commercial indicators as well, commercial EAs as well, all these things. Yeah, I mean, already a long time ago. Uh, my advice is clearly, everybody listening, stay away from commercial EAs. First of all, you know, the problem is that these uh, trading bots, which are sold online, they show you all these great curves. And the reality is that most of them are based on some kind of martingale system. So they create some stable return just to completely blow up. And I find that very, very wrong. You know, like it's misleading people. It always ends in a horrible manner, you know, like, and don't fall for it. If you mm. really are serious, you know, about automated trading, then you need to create a strategy yourself. Nobody can do it for you. And let me be honest here. It is a multi-year process. You can't expect... And you have to do it also in the right way. You know what I mean? You need to tick data. You need to uh, incorporate a variable spread, slippage, commissions. You need to test your strategy over different data sets. You know, you need to change and adjust your strategy. So to be honest with you, we're talking about, you know, a few thousand lines of, of code, most likely. And, and you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's a complex process. Now, personally, I love that. And I have done that, you know, like... Uh, and my recommendation, even to purely manual traders, is really to do some testing. Even if it's not your intent to create an automated strategy or to, to you know, automate a large part of your trading, you will learn so much just by actually testing several strategies. You see? I see. So are the commercially available products out there, are they user-friendly enough for newer traders to um, program in different scenarios uh, so they can test out uh, their ideas? Unfortunately, the general answer to that would be no. I cannot recommend, you know, anyone to to buy, you know, a commercial bot and then, you know, to, to just test it a few weeks on demo and then to test it live. Because, and you know what? Um, it's also difficult to explain, but for some reason, if you do not understand every single part of such a complex strategy, for some reason also, you know, you're not in a position to know uh, whether, for example, this is the right market condition for an automated strategy or not, you see? 
Like, so I, I have to be very honest here and warn people because, you know, like, of course, that's what many people are trying to do. You know, they think, come on, I put down a few hundred dollars and I buy, you know, some strategy, uh, you know, online and, you know, I can use that to, to trade. So in, in the vast majority of cases, this will not end well. However, of course, at the same time, I should also say, I'm sure that somewhere around the world, you know, there may be one uh, bot which is commercially available, which is not too bad. And if somebody really, you know, invests work to understand every single component, given that the creators are willing to disclose those components, that is, you know, maybe that can also work for someone. But, you know, what I've seen so far, Ian, in the industry is not great. And, you know, and that's also maybe one of the themes, like I, I'm very interested in, in showing reality. I don't want to sell people any dreams, you know. Look, if you become a doctor, Ian, <laughs> you have to go through a, so seven years of hard studying. You know, after that, you have to, you know, go through like all this learning as a practitioner. Now, of course, everybody can open a trading account and place some money. You know, it's not something where, where there are legal restrictions, but the complexity, especially when we talk about Forex, is high. That means, to summarize that part, if you uh, want to trade profitably, consistently, you, know, you need a proven edge, like, for example, the market causality. It needs to be something very you know, sophisticated, which actually gives you an edge. It can't just be some simple statistic, uh, statistical system. Next to all you know, the other things such as you know, you know, like discipline, mindset, et cetera, et cetera, that needs to be a given. If you then dedicate yourself you know, to, to really commit yourself to the Forex market, you have a chance. And look, I'm in a position today, Ian, to say, yes, I mean, like I have guided people through that, you know, successfully. And, you know, like the, the few people who know my work, you know, some of them do very, very well. And, you know, I'm very proud of that. But, you know, uh, you need to really be realistic regarding your expectations. It's just, I see. The, yeah, the Forex market is one of the most difficult financial markets to trade. That's the reality. Yeah. So you would you would suggest that newer traders or people who don't have much programming experience just simply don't get involved with these commercially available program trading uh, options. Is that correct? That's correct. So either really uh, create your own strategy from scratch, okay? And you don't need to be able to program, uh, okay? Uh, find a programmer you like, and, you know, pay him to create a strategy you put together, Otherwise, the risk is that you get caught up in the actual programming and you lose the view of the strategy itself, you know, the big picture. That's a big risk. And, you know, like really go down that path and create a strategy and in the best case, a handful of strategies, which, you know, are consistently profitable. That means, Ian, which show you a good uh, equity curve over, let's say, the last uh, uh, eight years, for example, yes? So that there can be drawdowns, yes, there can be flat periods, all of that. But over, let's say, the last eight years, including, you know, like variable spreads, uh, slippage and all that, the, the, the curve needs to be stable. If you are able to reach that, then, you know, you can demo test it, forward test it. And if the strategy works live as it does uh, in your testing, you have a chance that you can take the strategy live. So can we get more specific, say, uh, when we talk about dumb money and smart money, is there a noticeable difference between how the dumb money and the smart money put on their positions and place their stops? Okay, that's the great question. And the answer is yes. It's not only a difference, it's literally the opposite. Okay, and maybe I start with a very simple example. Um, You know, like there are these... uh, uh, principles everybody seems to believe for example you buy your market you place your own stop below the recent low now this is the worst thing you can do <laughs> you know what i mean i mean you're setting yourself up to just be short term stop hunted yeah so all these things people believe for whatever reason tend to be completely wrong and that's by the way why the statistics are so harsh as we discussed at the beginning now let me give you um, a little hint already the dump money tends to trade reversals so if you would ask me, Jamal, can you please give a very simplistic example? I would say, well, most of the time, the dumb money tries to enter cheaply into markets. So trade some kind of mean reversion strategy, you know, where they expect the price to go back to some kind of mean, some kind of average. And most of the time that results in a failed reversal and the price going further in the previous direction. 
cleaning out the lows and the stops which are placed there by the, the money buyers and even doing so in an exaggerated fashion until, you know, like the ones who try to trade reversals again and again and again, lose again and again and again. I see in your videos, uh, you show these green and red position bars, uh, which you say represent dumb money positions. Uh, where can we see the smart money positions? Okay, that's a great question. So what you see mainly on the charts is basically the, the dumb money uh, trades. Yeah, their, their positions, their stops, their, the different types of stops. We come to that in a second. Uh, we, we do not directly see the smart money. I used to have one indicator, which was actually showing um, certain activities by the smart money. But by, a, by reverse engineering the market, it's not even necessary to directly see the smart money, believe it or not. All you need to do is to understand uh, certain principles, which is, you know, like only a handful of principles. You need to understand um, the actual dynamics. And I would like to talk about that in a, in a second, at least one uh, specific example. And, you know, that's more than enough to, you know, like to avoid being stop hunted yourself, to avoid being position hunted, to avoid getting lured into the market and ending up with a horrible position, which, which in the worst case, ends up blowing your account, you see? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe let, let's talk about a, a, an example, Ian. So yes. let's just, uh, what you see, I mean, on the 5th of September, I sent you a chart of Euro dollar on the forward time frame. you remember? And, and you could see already then that, you know, there were a lot of dumb money buyers trying to buy the market, expecting Euro dollar to do a reversal up. And many of those guys actually placed their stops below the low, you remember? Yes. And, and then when you look at the screenshot from yesterday, uh, of, uh, again, of Euro dollar, you see that it went all the way down to 0 0.956. So it, actually what happened in the days in between, more and more longies kept on buying Euro dollar. And what happened? The smart money algos pushed Euro dollar down again and again, creating dollar strength and, and taking out all the stops until today, until like three hours ago, where we had a little bit of shorties coming to the market. And guess what? There's a little pullback in, in, in Euro dollar right now, 0 0.964. You see? But um, so let's talk a bit more in detail. Um, let's assume we have that scenario from the 5th of September. Let's say, you know, it's euro dollar. Let's say the market is uh, full of dumb money longies. Yes. Now, let's assume, Ian, that above the price, let's say back then 1.01 .01 or whatever it was, there is a big stop target. Yeah. So like a big yellow line. Now, the stop target. So yes. uh, are we talking about how many uh, traders have put their stops in at very similar levels? Exactly. So let's assume it's the same market structure like, like on the screenshot, that long is in euro dollar. And let's just assume that above the price, you know, like let's say 40, 50 pips away, there is a big stock accumulation. Yeah. So where, mm -hmm. where a lot of stops accumulated. Here's the thing, Ian, and that's also counterintuitive. The smart money algo has no reason whatsoever to directly push euro dollar up and take out the upper stop. Because if they would do so, Ian, all these dumb money longies, which are already in the market and their positions are above the price, they would temporarily get into profit, isn't it? Yes. So, so you know, like that's the reason why in such a scenario, the smart money will not take out even a big stop accumulation if that would imply that some of the dumb money positions would get into profit. Well, wouldn't it, wouldn't they look at the size of the longs and the size of the shorts and determine, okay, well, uh, you know, if we push up the price, then the longies will be profitable. But if the size of the longies is relatively small compared to the, those who are short and have a big, you know, a, many stops at a higher level, are, are the, does a smart, is a smart money, tempted then to just say okay that's okay we'll we'll let some of the um longies make some profit and we'll drive up the price to uh hit these stops forcing the shorts to cover their stops and if that is the case does a smart money calculate the amount of money necessary to push up the price to trigger these stop losses and do, do they ever come into a situation where a it's not really worth it they calculate the amount cost to push up the price and then they back away because it's too expensive Okay, that's an excellent comment, and you are exactly right. That's exactly how it is. So um, that's right, exactly like you say. So 
And that's also where we get to a bit more advanced topics such as uh, the dumb money tolerance. So there is some dumb money tolerance around the price. Otherwise, the, the market wouldn't move as much as it did. But let, maybe let me give you a very good example to, to um, explain this, this point which you have uh, talked about now because that makes it, I think, very clear. Let's assume, Ian, exactly like you say, we have dumb money longies in the market, yeah? There is a uh, stop above the price, yeah, of the dumb money shorties. Now, mm -hmm. let's assume, Ian, that uh, we have a big news item. Let's say U.S. unemployment being published, yes? Yes. Now, now, guess what? Let's say the unemployment rate is way lower than expected, 2% lower than expected. So what does the smart money do? They push euro dollar down against all these longies, taking them out and pricing in this, let's say, economic plausibility for the outside world. Because it looks like, come on, dollar, the dollar got stronger against the euro because unemployment in the US was lower than expected. Therefore, euro dollar went down, isn't it? Right. That makes sense. Now, but let's now take the opposite scenario where the news result is suddenly much worse than expected. Okay. So unemployment is suddenly 2% higher than expected. So they would need to let your dollar go up, you know, and have some dollar weakness in order to price it in. Now, in this scenario we discussed, we said we have longies in the market. So those longies would win. So, but we also said there's a stop above the price. So guess what, Ian? They go up, they quickly take the stop out, which was on the upper side, like 40, 50 pips of the shorties. And what do they do, Ian? They instantly go down again. And that's a typical price action we see these days. And that, by the way, is the reason why you don't have news traders anymore on Forex. Because the willingness, exactly like you said before, Ian, the willingness of the smart money to either go after the dumb money positions or to go you know, after a specific uh, stop area or to uh, create some economic possibility, of course, fully depends on the amount of, you know, like the dumb money as well as, you know, the, the overall market structure. It's exactly like you said. And also what you, what you said in the, in the second sentence is true as well. There are scenarios where, you know, the picture is not clear enough And by the way, that's, these are the cases where we as causality traders stay away because we are not at par with the smart money. Yeah. We are not 10 steps behind them like the dumb money, but we as causality traders are still two or three steps behind the smart money. So we wait for very clear situations. Whenever there is a scenario like the one you described where you cannot clearly see which of the uh, factors will be prioritized by the smart money algorithms, we don't risk our capital. I see. Would it make sense for the for the dumb money to s not use um, regular stop loss orders and just use mental stop losses? Because by using a regular stop loss, they make their intentions known and puts a big bullseye on their forehead for the smart money to run their stops. Unfortunately, Ian, the answer to that question is no, because if you do not use a stop in your trading, your downside is unlimited. So one single move could blow your account. You know, you, you have to use stops one way or another to protect your downside, you know. But what you say, excellent that you say it because many people come to that conclusion. And guess what? That's a trap in itself. Because if you don't use a stop, yeah, eventually, Ian, there will be some move which is so unusual. Remember, for example, the Euro Swissy and, and you know, the so-called flash crash thousands of pips in, uh, in movements, et cetera, where you, where you put your whole account at risk. So the solution to that is not to not use stops. However, I have to say, in all fairness, that why I also recently more and more promote using stops yourself and actually going for balanced risk return, et cetera, there are people who trade the causality and they do not place a stop order in the market. However, Ian, they are they either already place a, a hedge. So let's say they want to buy euro dollar. They already place a sell stop below the price where, you know, their position will be hedged. Or if they don't even do that, they will use very low leverage in, you know, like that's another thing. You can, you can destroy any strategy by over leveraging. Yeah. Even, even the causality. If you don't use reasonable risk parameters, you can still mess it up. <laughs> Right. I'm curious, where where does the uh, smart money hang out? I mean, I've heard of this 
thing called dark pools do m- many of their transactions and, and their positions? If we had access to the dark pools, could we see their positions in there? Yes. So, um, yes. So first of all, um, think about the uh, smart money players as, as some kind of cartel. They will not trade against each other. It wouldn't make any sense. Similar to the prisoner's dilemma, you know, in economics, they will not end up trading against each other. Their algorithms are aligned. They don't need manual intervention. This is all automated. This is done by, you know, like programmers. They're, they use certain things such as dark pools uh, and other things, I'm sure, to align, you know, like their overall uh, market making process, let's say. And, uh, you know, they have price control. And please, again, I, I would like to emphasize that don't take it from me. You know, <laughs> I mean, I've done a video where I have summarized it and I've put together some news articles and all kinds of evidence, you see. But I can tell you right now, Ian, if you talk to any senior uh, uh, professional from the industry, whether it's an investment banker, or whatever, they all know exactly uh, what's going on. And again, allow me to emphasize once more, Ian, it, all of this may be necessary to a certain point. Because think about it, Ian. If you would be a market maker and you just earn the spread between the bid and ask, would you take the full price risk? I mean, there is no perfect hedge neither. You see, like it's intuitive that, you know, there is some control also on the market by certain entities, you know, which provide liquidity as it's called. You know, if you ask me, it has never really been different also in historical terms in, in, in any financial markets, you know, like. The difference is, Ian, that these days, you know, we went through a whole phase of algorithmization, of automation. That's the difference. You know, like the market is efficient in the sense of the fact that it's a fully oiled machine (laughs) and they what they do works very well for them. And it's very repetitive, (laughs) you see. And, and, And to come back to our discussion at the beginning, please, if you are a novice and you listen to all that, Understand, this is why you need to understand how this works if you want to, to trade successfully, because otherwise you simply fall victim to, to those games which are played. As simple as that. Can retail traders ever get access to seeing dark pool activity and therefore adjusting their trading strategy? Retail traders do not really have a chance to get access to any of that. I mean, I offer to to see my charts uh, on the website. You can subscribe. It's called MK Web, and you see my charts live with everything on it. You see that seems to be the best the best uh, chance they have. And please understand again, Ian. You know I'm a full time trader. I created this product because that's what I would have needed myself when I started out. You see, if I when I first started out in forex had this tool, I would have been the happiest man in the world. It, mm-hmm. it didn't exist, so you know I created it. And by the way. I created that after I, I published, you know, these principles because I started around four years ago publishing uh, screenshots and predictions and all that. And then some people said, okay, Jamal, we got it, but can you offer something? So I had to go back to the drawing board, you know, uh, put together a plan to, to, you know, make it possible that people can see that chart and, and, and trade them, you know? So that was the whole process and it took a lot of time because, you know, as I said before, I'm, I'm trading first of foremost so i did that kind of by the side but yeah it's completed and 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 people can use that but look i mean uh the the important message here is that uh there is a this there's an informational advantage by by these players um if you do not uh, put in the homework you're easy prey you know and and there's no simple solution to that if you say okay you know what i will just not use stops so i can't get stopped out what happens, you will eventually end up on the Damani side and, you know, you will have a, a big drawdown. And what happens then, Ian? People try to average down. They try to trade at cheaper prices and the whole downward spiral gets worse and worse and worse. Does a typical Forex trading platforms allow traders to see where all the stop losses are and at what levels? Not really. I mean, that, as far as I know, the last time I checked, which is a while ago. I mean, they're out there. There are different uh, uh, commercial uh, offerings, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like the, there used to be like services where you could at least see, let's say, uh, uh, some stops or something. Unfortunately, Ian, this is not enough. And maybe explain that because that brings us also to the next point. Um, look, stops in particular, Ian, yes, they are important, but 
they are not the dominant factor as such. Because guess what? If you have a clear target above the price, yeah, let's say you have a big medium-term stop accumulation. Yes, you know that eventually it will be taken. However, on average, I would estimate that around eight to ten counter moves will be implemented by the smart money algos before they do the actual main target run. You see, I call this pre-main run counter move. You understand? Mm -hmm. And that's maybe something we should explain a bit because that's also where people can get a flavor. And that's also where things are a little bit counterintuitive because look, most of us, if we see a big line on the chart and we know, okay, the price wants to take that level, we tend to stay, okay, I buy towards the line. But no, if you want to be more sophisticated and accurate, you need to understand things such as the time and range principle. The smart money algos, Ian, are not in a rush. They do not need to quickly take out any stop for that matter, you see? Mm -hmm. Like, they have all the time in the world. So what do they do? They make sure that any the money positions which are placed in front of that target are what I call priced in. There are counter moves against them. Sometimes the market goes flat for 10 hours just to make sure if there are any day traders, you know, whatever, who try to trade towards the upper target, they close their position before the move. <laughs> you see, now it's important to understand by implementing those principles, such as the pre-main run counter principle and the time and range principle and so on, by imp implementing them constantly, they make sure, Ian, that on the dumb money side, no matter whether people bought or sold or whether they trade reversals or breakouts or pullbacks or whether they are scalping as a collective not individually but as a collective they lose you see and mm -hmm. that's that's hopefully something which is now you know also a realization for people listening to this because it's also counterintuitive you know you would say come on i mean first of all we, when we look at the pri naked price chart there are big trends they exist there are breakouts, which, you know, like are followed by a proper move. There are reversals where the market suddenly completely changes direction. These things exist on, on the naked chart. But, you know, one has to understand how the mechanics are because the price is just the output from the market structure, not the other way around. So just to uh, summarize, the word stop hunting is a word that you use to describe a cartel-like action of smart money uh, that concentrates their trades to push the price up or down to hit stop losses, which will then trigger uh, a cascading sell-off, for example, which will push the price down further and then thereby enable the smart money to flip their positions at a profit. Is that accurate? That's correct. That's exactly right. So that means that the stop targets are kind of the final phase. These are the moves. So the, the price moves towards those target levels. They are kind of the last phase where the smart money finishes up, you know, because first of all, market participants who have the stops at those levels, they get kicked out at a loss. Yeah. The ones who didn't use stops, they may get are over leveraged in the worst case. They get a margin call. The ones who, who try to just hold over, you know, they may get into a, a deep and long, long drawdown. So that's exactly right. We often see these days, Ian, that the market goes to the target level and that once by the pip almost the, the target has been cleared, they snap back up. You see, like that's, that's typical house key moves we see a lot these days. This is why, you know, like Forex is destroying so many simplistic systems. You know, the ones who try to trade trends, they get whipsawed. The ones who try to trade reversals, they suffer from uh, failed reversals over and over again. You see, like this erratic price action, which looks, you know, very irregular to like the outsider, is the result of these kind of constellations. As simple as that. To the point where sometimes, and, and again, please watch all the videos I posted over the years. It's very repetitive. You see these things. Often I could capture it on camera. You know how the price goes exactly to the target and then snaps all the way back up once the target has been cleared. There is no way for, for someone sitting at a naked price chart, you know, to, to cope with that, if you ask me. You know? I, I see. Can you give us a specific example of what you look for to enter and exit from a trade? Uh sure. So um, uh, that depends on, you know, like which kind of uh, setup I'm, I'm trading. I mean, let's talk about... Uh, a few specific examples. 
So let's talk about maybe the post stop on trade because, you know, this is an easier setup to trade. So that's in a situation where the market overall is rather ranging. There is a clear target. The target gets taken out. The price overshoots maybe a little. And then the price falls back into the range. This can be tradable because, you know, like you can see in front of you that the job is finished. The stops have been cleared. The smart, the, the dump money goes also to the opposite direction, you know? So they, that's the other thing. Like most of the time when you observe the causality live, you will be surprised how well the smart money algos tricks work, you know, like they work over and over again. You know, sometimes by simply drawing a certain pattern on the chart, let's say, you know, like they draw like a double top. So people, for some reason, think a double top is, is you know, a place to sell the market. And then suddenly, you know, there's a big, strong price bar to the upside. And <laughs> what looked beforehand as a double top doesn't now look as a like a double top at all. You know, like it, it looks just like, you know, some messy, messy price action, you see? So I see. And that's a direct result of there being a lot of stop losses right above that double top uh, for them to trigger. And if there wasn't those stop losses there, for example, or say the amount was very small, would the smart money say, hey, it's not really worth uh, fooling with this here? That's exactly the point. And that's the reason, Ian, why, of course, if you look at the historic chart, of course you find double tops and double bottoms, you know, and, and Ws. Of course you find these patterns. But like you say, exactly like you say, the only reason why these patterns then were successful is because, you know, either the smart, the, the money was again on the wrong side, you know, or the job has been completed, the main target has been cleared out. You see, it's that's exactly right. So now to come back to your to your question, so one particular setup would be, for example, to to wait and you know then trade the counter move after the stop run. But let's talk about the second setup, the so-called uh, the money switch, because right now when you look at euro dollar, you see this nice move up. And as you if you would see my charts, you would see that the dumb money is switched from long to short. So within the last eight nine hours, we suddenly have sellers, the money sellers coming into the market, the red bars. That is the only reason why right now as we speak, euro dollar is going up against those shorties. Such a setup, I call it the money switch because the money literally switches from one side to the other, can be, for example, a tradable setup. What we typically do in those cases is we wait at least until the previous low has been cleared, which has happened here, by the way. So the low in euro dollar around the 0.9566 level had been cleared. And then the price comes back up into the range and, and dumb money sellers keep on coming into the market. In that case, you can buy and, and trade the actual dumb money switch. This is a second example. But allow me to give you a third example, which is very relevant looking at the recent weeks, yeah, which is a squeeze. And I feel very strongly about that one because people are so confused. When you look at dollar yen, Ian, of, look at since Feb this year, it went up 3,000 pips, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it was a big move. Uh, <laughs> you see, like it, they went up and up. There were only two pullbacks even. You know, apart from that, it was like a strong move to the upside. Now, that's a typical squeeze move. And we actually have a separate indicator. That's the indicator you see on the on the bottom of the chart, you know, where the, the squeeze itself gets shown. This indicator shows you overall. Is the dump money overall rather long or rather short? And is it increasing in that direction? And this is a typical squeeze move. That means, for whatever reason, Ian, the dumb money keeps on selling into the market over weeks in this case, which is crazy, and the price goes up. Now, you can, as a causality trader, you can trade that, but you will, of course, trade at expensive prices there. That's something where people sometimes have a psychological barrier. And again, it looks like counterintuitive because you see a chart which already from went from the lower left corner of your screen to the upper right, and then you decide to buy it, you know, after it came up so much. But you can absolutely do that if you are a causality trader. You can ex enter expensively into the market and write, you know, the next 100 pips up. And, you know, and, and personally also, I recommend yourself in those cases to use a clear stop just in case, you know, that, that for example, there's a dumb money switch or, you know, dumb money leaves the market all of a sudden and the price actually turns, you know, you, you just get out. You understand? 
I see. So uh, on your videos, I noticed that you have these position bars where you show where the smart money is and then uh, mm -hmm. both long and short and then the stop levels. Do you adjust your trading strategy such that you will wait until those stops get cleared out first? Um, do you take that into consideration? Well, uh, I'm obviously experienced. So I also trade towards the targets. So, so it allowed me to elaborate. Uh, if you know, and that's actually also a good strategy. If you see, you know, first of all, Ian, uh, it's important that there are three different types of stops. Okay, there are short term stops, there are medium term stops, and there are long term stops. On our charts, you see the medium term stops as orange and yellow. You see the short term stops as blue, and the long term stops as pink. To make a long story short, Ian, the most important stops, especially when it comes to actually trading those moves themselves, are the medium term stops. You will see quickly that eventually those medium term stops get taken out, you know, after the smart money algos did what they what they had to do. You can absolutely trade those moves. However, as I said before, you have to take into consideration that for each of those target runs towards the target. On average, there are there's a number of counter moves literally to the opposite direction. So what you can do, Ian, and you can also work with limit orders, by the way. That's very, very convenient. You can say, you know what? I see, let's say like cable right now. Look, there are medium term stops around the 1.072 level. You know, eventually the, the price goes there. But you know also that right now, it's not a great entry price. You have some shorties in the way also, and you have stops on the upper side. So why don't you place a limit to sell? You know, let's say 50, 60 pips above the price with the target, you know, at the at just a few pips above the medium term stops. You see what I mean? So the causality enables you to make those kind of uh, precise decisions. And to answer your question again, yes, I, I traded also on the on the live trades a lot of medium term stop runs. The easiest scenarios to trade the MTS runs is within the squeeze, Ian. That means... For example, in Euro dollar also during the last weeks, and you can see the videos I've made during that time period, you see the longies are coming into the market. You see the big medium-term stops of the longies below the price. So you can literally short, even though it's an expensive entry, and you can place your own target just above the medium-term stops accumulations. You know? and, and as I said before, uh, in the best case, also your own stop in a, in a similar distance on the upside above potential longies because most likely if the price goes against you it will turn again to the downside at the longie positions i see uh so we've been talking a lot about short-term manipulation uh by the smart money and i'd like to transition the conversation to government intervention and uh price supporting or price suppression in the long term and as we saw last week uh japan's uh action in their markets by selling off U.S. treasuries and then buying their greatly weakened currency with the U.S. dollar that they just received. Uh, was this action a surprise to you? And do you see more of this coming by other countries uh, that have a, a weak currency? Okay, that's a great topic as well. Okay, so let's talk about that. Um, looking at dollar yen and the example you mentioned, um, Here's how that works in a nutshell. First of all, central banks, no matter which currency in general, um, they, of course, are concerned about uh, currency rates when it comes to very large deviations from certain levels. Yeah, the, the, Like the central banks literally do not really care much about short-term moves. So, you know, like a, a few hundred pips is nothing for them. However, as you uh, mentioned, if we talk about the multi-thousand pip move, and this affects, you know, like whole economies and world trade, <laughs> as it does, no question about it. Of course, you know, the central banks eventually will do something. However, let's take a close look what they did exactly. Now, when dollar yen went up already, I think like 2,200, 2,300 pips, the Japanese central bank started to make certain comments, you know? So they start, like always, they start to, you know, uh, give certain announcements, un unscheduled announcements in the press, which then end up on our uh, uh, spark boxes, et cetera. No? And, and as you remember, before the, the last statement, they already said, oh, you know, looking at recent Forex prices, we will consider, you know, what to do monetary policy-wise or, you know, like how this will affect trade, et cetera. Now, the reality is 
first of all, it's all a little bit of a game because the central bank well is aware that any comments they make in this direction can already uh, in, uh, change currency prices. They know that very well. In fact, the, as a footnote, there's a whole economic theory how you know you can manage inflation expectations, interest rate change expectations, etc. However, as you can see, what happened after they started to make those comments, shortness came in the market again. So the market went up, you know, another good thousand pips up to the point where we talked about like 144, 145. And then, you know, at those kind of price levels, they started to, you know, make stronger uh, statements, you know, and, and the market started to lose momentum. So what I want to say to make a long story short is to summarize the whole case. And it's interesting that you brought it up because, you know, that's a bit more advanced. Yes, the the central banks will, of course, uh, always have in mind what the forex market is doing. But first of all, they are certainly not concerned about short-term price movements. In my personal opinion, Ian, they are very well aware of all these dynamics I've discussed today. But, you know, it's not that that is something which is very important for them. Whenever a market goes really out of line and we have serious macroeconomic consequences, like in this case, they eventually will do something. However, let's be honest here also. At the end of the day, Ian, look, Japan with this weak yen will have, you know, a lot of exporting, you see? So the, since the country is, is a big exporting uh, country, it may be in the interest even, at least for a certain time period, you know, to have a weaker currency because that can sometimes boost, you know, exports and all that. You see what I mean? So considering that there's the distinction between uh, policy-making entities and monetary policy, uh, politicians and, you know, uh, businesses and, you know, the domestic economy and their potential to export, etc. you know, <laughs> like uh, overall, when you look at the big picture, you can see there are different interests uh, at stake. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good uh, description. Uh, so wrapping up, um, what key advice would you give to new traders in the Forex market? Okay, so first and foremost, you know, after this little insight you got today, <laughs> yeah, be aware that when you're starting out as a trader and you want to focus on Forex, the odds are really against you. That's a fact. Take this as a given. Now, if you're really, really, uh, let's say, as crazy as me, <laughs> and you're <laughs> as uh, you know, uh, passionate about the market as me, and you're willing to put in effort, yes, and to put in hours, and to learn how you can trade that market, and you're serious about it, yes, you, this is achievable. Okay, be realistic. You will not get rich overnight, okay? You will not make loads of money in your first two, three years. but if you, you know, have the discipline which is required in this game, if you put in the hours, if you set yourself up for success by having a proven edge, you know, by having your risk management in place and all these things, it can be an amazing path for you, okay? The potential is there. It has certain aspects no other financial market can offer you, okay? And if you are in control, okay, it's an awesome uh, thing to do because, you know, like, uh, you're not just trading some small peripheral market, you know, some futures on a particular bond or whatever, you know, you are basically kind of trading the world. But if you want to be uh, successful in this endeavor, be realistic, okay? Do not believe what's shown to you on the internet. Always understand what are the incentives of, you know, the people talking and explaining, you know what I mean? Like, uh, are they actual traders? You know, is, what's what's the evidence? You know, have they actually over a longer time period also shown how things really work, or do they just want to make a quick buck? Okay, be very very skeptical, and then you know, look, the upside in this journey is first of all, Ian, you will get to know yourself on a very deep level because you know, believe it or not, by trying to become a successful trader, you will really understand your own psychology. You will understand your emotions, okay, your incentives. You will understand a lot of truth about yourself because it is necessary that you know yourself very well. Otherwise, you will make mistakes, you will quickly lose money, and you will become a victim, you know, to other market participants who are very well prepared in this game. So be aware that whenever you click the button in Forex, you made a decision 
where you are very confident that this risk you took on that trade is worth it and other institutions around the world and brilliant minds around the world will be beaten eventually by that decision you made. <laughs> and wow. since, you know, since it's very necessary to be very humble as a trader, you know, and that's by the way, Eden, as you know, better than me, all the good traders, they are nice people. They're very humble. They can't afford to be arrogant. You cannot afford to be arrogant or ignorant in this game. Stop, you know, coming with ideas or expectations or theories to the game. Stop it. Take reality as it is. Okay. Try to become the best decision maker you can be. Okay. Have realistic expectations. Do your homework. I mean, I could show you on my screen now. For years, Ian, I have made screenshots from every single market. Sometimes, you know, every few hours, I have thousands, ten thousands of screenshots. I ha in order to come to this stage today, I had to go through a very long process. It was a lot of pain, let me be honest. But, you know, look, I could, by documenting these factors, I was able in the end, by never giving up, to come to this position today where, you know, I can give you that information firsthand. And, you know, that's the reason also why I was really excited to, to be in your show today. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Jamal. Uh, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Yeah. So uh, if you are interested in that kind of stuff, you know, uh, my YouTube channel is called SMEFX. I still do like, you know, some live updates there. I don't do so much live trading anymore uh, these days. But, you know, on a regular basis, I still post videos there. The website is www.sme-fx.com. So there, you know, there's also a forum. You can talk to others who have, you know, learned to become causality traders. You can consider to subscribe to, you know, like the, the screenshots and all that. Um, I'm very honored I was able to be on the podcast. Keep on doing what you're doing, guys. It's great. You know, I really appreciate your efforts, you know, to talk to traders around the world. It's so interesting. I've been listening to your podcast for quite some years. And it's, you know, even if there's some trader who trades a different market, it's always interesting to, you know, get insights, you know, regarding their methods, their thoughts. So what you're doing is fantastic. You know, it's probably the modern equivalent to Jack Schwager's Market Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Thank you very much, Jamal. Looking forward to uh, talking with you again soon. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.